good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us in this uh, online lecture here at uh, Tilburg University. Uh, my name is Kenny Meesters. I'm a lecturer in information management here at the university. And uh, well, this is, uh, of course, unique circumstances, um, but we also wanted to continue with our education and we wanted to reach out, make this lecture public, because today, this lecture, we're talking about online collaboration and remote working. Um, just as an introduction, this course, uh, this class is part of a bigger course on management and information systems. And in this course, we talk about different developments, um, how these developments impact organizations and companies, and how that transforms them into a, like, a new century, a new way of working. Um, so this course runs for 14 weeks, and today is one of the classes of the course. Uh, the course is meant for our bachelor uh, students of business economics, and um, those students uh, have been following different courses. So this course is not per se about the technology, it's not uh, a deep dive in what is technically possible or on online education. Today we're really talking about what does this shift mean uh, one working physically in the same building to online. And aside from these five trends that we discuss in our classes, actually today, of course, there is a sort of second or sixth trend or push, which is this uh, virus outbreak that actually m moves us as organizations and society to start exploring these other trends and what they can mean for us. Um, due to the outbreak and the consequences and the government regulations, uh, you know, we're looking at alternative ways of working. We're looking at how technology can help us transform and deal with these uh, changes. So one of these changes, uh, that's going to be the topic of today's class. Uh, it's about enhancing uh, organizational communication and collaboration. Um, and this is a key aspect of uh, societies and organization these days because technology allows us to work remotely, allows us to connect even though we're not at the physical same place or even if we're not working at the same time. So we decided that with that topic on the agenda and the developments that are going on that today would actually be uh, a good opportunity to show that you can do online teaching, that you can work remotely. Uh, partly because it's the content of the course, but also because we are doing that as a university, as many universities are in the Netherlands, currently transitioning from in-classroom teaching to online education. Um, and that change is pretty apparent. Uh, this morning when I walked into the university, this was what I saw. Uh, the building uh, deserted, uh, no students. Students uh, are not allowed to come to the university. Most of the staff is not allowed to come to the university. And you will see these empty hallways. Uh, I think whether that's a university or a company, you will probably recognize these images even in the streets. And um, our university is also uh, strongly advising on the screens everywhere for people to take precautions. Uh, of course, I'm at the university, but uh, doing this uh, class online. Uh, and, but I can tell you there is almost nobody else in the room except for IT support who are sitting about seven meters away from me. Uh, we're using disinfectants. So we're taking every precaution and following every advice that we get, and I recommend you do the same. Um, so that's the developments in the physical world. But if we look at the developments in the online world, we see actually an increase. Uh, you might recognize tools like Microsoft uh, Teams or Slack or Work or Zoom. And actually, uh, we see a rapid increase. Over four times as much of these tools have been being used in the last days. So there is a tremendous move and use of these tools. It's not only the tools that we're using, because uh, this is from a Dutch website. So my apologies that this article is in Dutch. It's from a website, Tweakers. And one of the features of the website is a price watch. And in this price watch, they can also see how many times people click on certain items. And what you will see in the graph uh, is that there is a rapid increase in the number of times people are searching for and clicking through when they want to buy a webcam. Um, so over the last days, there's been a tremendous increase in people buying webcams, 
docking stations, headsets, and so on. So all of that, these two trends, using the tools and buying the equipment, means that we're getting ready uh, and start moving towards working remotely. If, you, uh, if the slides are a bit hard to read or we're switching back and forth, no worries. Uh, later on, we'll post the slides in full uh, so you can follow and you can read along when you watch this video later. Um, but for now, um, these are some of the trends that are happening. So what are we gonna talk about today? What's today's agenda? Well, we have two parts. The first part is this lecture where we talk a little bit more about the theory, about the practical implications, uh, about, about three topics. Why do we need to work, communicate, and collaborate in the first place? How has technology and uh, the internet and the web evolved to make that possible? And finally, what are some of the considerations to making that work? So in case you get lost, I put the three colors in there, gold, green, and blue, the colors of our university. Uh, so you will see the same colors in the header. So if you get lost or you're wondering where we are, uh, remember those uh, colors. After, my, after this initial lecture, we're gonna have a short break, uh, and then we're gonna continue with a panel. And in this panel, we've invited four uh, different uh, people, people with expertise, people with experience, to talk about what it does it mean for our organization as a university, what does it mean for other organizations, this shift. Uh, so we will be joined by our IT services director from the university, our, one of our academic directors, a student, and an expert on telecommunications. So um, after the break, we're going to talk a little bit more about these topics and these challenges and what they mean now in a practical basis. Okay, so as I said, let's get started with the first part. Why do we need to change? Uh, why do we actually need to communicate? Why do we collaborate? So organizations, they collaborate uh, for various reasons, but most of all, uh, collaboration and thus communication ensures that we uh, pull together our talents, strengths, and ideas. For example, now I'm teaching this class and I can focus on the content because we, I'm collaborating with people who have an expertise in audiovisual support and IT support. Um, it also increases learning. You, when you put different people together, they will learn from each other. You, get, you can transfer skills. And of course, there is efficiency because you can specialize, uh, you can support, you can help each other. And humans are social creatures. The fact that we are collaborating, that you have a role to play in a team, enhances your job satisfaction. So that's why these, uh, these are four examples of why collaboration is important. There are many more, but these are some key aspects that especially play a role now that we don't uh, work together, especially if you look at enhanced job satisfaction. So how do we collaborate? Well, traditionally it was fairly easy for small teams and small organizations to meet physically, to work in the same place, and uh, that was usually easy. You set a time, you set a place. Larger companies, international organizations, uh, larger institutes were already working remotely a lot and they're using different channels for communication and collaboration. However, today that has changed. Uh, now every organization is more connected with other organizations. We're doing outsourcing. We're doing uh, you know, uh, remote collaboration. We're hiring expertise. Uh, we have suppliers, we have vendors, we have customers all over the globe. So this globalization, this networked approach means that we are more and more connected. And our work-life balance has shifted. And in the last days, it has shifted dramatically, which means that we were already slowly moving towards ch different concepts of working. You could work at home, you could work uh, remotely, you could work in the evening, you could work in the morning, and so on. So the work-life balance and the, the options you have to choose to work when and where you want were already increasing. And now there has been this tremendous push for it in the last days. So what happens when you work uh, remotely together? It is actually uh, a formation of a virtual team. So virtual teams are made of people that work in different places, work in different times. Uh, and they face certain challenges when you communicate. So those challenges, for example, is that you might be awake at different times. If you work around the globe, you might not be in the physical same room. And technologies can help to uh, reduce those barriers and allow teams, virtual teams, to work together. 
Uh, so you can actually say that what are these challenges? Well, one of these challenges is the distance. So as you can see in the slide, you can either work in the same place or you can work in a different place. And another axis that you could uh, perceive would be the time. So you work at the same time or you work at a different time. So that's whether you work synchronous or not. So if you map out these four quadrants, we would say, well, you can work synchronous in person, you could work remotely uh, at the same time, you could work at different times, but in the same place, or you can work at different times in different places. And there's all kinds of interactions that could, you could map out. So I'll give you an example. So here on the left side of the screen, you will see a couple of interactions and technologies. And I'll give you a minute to think about where you would place them. So which of these are, for example, real-time, in-person, which of these are uh, remotely real-time, which are not real-time and remotely. Okay, well, since we put it online, you can pause it later if you want more time to think about it. Uh, but this is how I would map them. Of course, you can argue for different, for different ways of doing this. But for example, uh, in in-person meeting, we do it at the same place at the same time. Uh, but if we use a pin board, for example, and I leave a message in the pantry for my colleagues to do their dishes, uh, it's at the same place, but at different times. I might put that message up in the morning and they might read it in the afternoon. Um, so on the remote, there's a lot of options you might recognize. Real-time remote, phone calls. Uh, but if you work at different times in different places, you use email, for example, so people will read it somewhere else at a different time than when you send it. Uh, and I'll give you one more to challenge, would be, uh, put it at the bottom left, is a lecture. So if I would ask you where in this quadrant you could put a lecture, Okay, so it's a bit of a trick question because you could actually place them in all four. You could have a lecture in person in the classroom, which these days is a, is a bit tricky. You could do a lecture, uh, you could follow it remotely, real time. So for the people who are watching now, uh, welcome. So you're the synchronous remote option. People who watch this later at their own PC are uh, asynchronous remote. And for those of you who are watching this at the university at some later stage, you know, those rare exceptions would be uh, same place, asynchronous. So these are a lot of like communications options and just we tend to think a lot about communication as in real time communication, phone calls, messages and so on. But those are not the only options. Uh, a lot of companies, organizations use intranets and employee portals. So they allow people to access information at their convenience in a structured way. So these intranets, employee portals now play a more important role where before you could walk to a secretary or a support team or you could ask somebody, you might not now need to rely more on these intranets and these portals. So it is really important that these are being updated and that they give the answers that the people are looking for to reduce unnecessary communication. So a lot of these portals, they will include uh, intranet, uh, uh, you could use Yammer, for example, from Microsoft, uh, or SharePoint, where people could upload documents, could ask questions, could provide updates or links to other systems. Uh, and a lot of self-service. So for example, this is a snapshot, uh, albeit a bit of an older version of the Tilburg University intranet. And what is interesting is that these intranets can be tailored. So for us as a staff member, we will see different options than when a student logs in because we have different information needs. So that allows us to find the information that we're looking for a lot faster. Um, so that's really asynchronous remote uh, information retrieval and sending. Uh, of course, now in these days, uh, there's, and I'm sure you all recognize, there's been a rapid increase in uh, the uh, video conferencing, which is uh, synchronous but remotely. And there's different options for that. Uh, there's extensive uh, uh, dedicated video conferencing systems that are really installed in a room with a lot of equipment and support. They're usually more expensive. 
But today, since technology has become cheaper, more accessible, connections have become better, there's also the option to do uh, video conferencing at your desktop, at home, uh, from your phone. Um, so video conferencing is, is, is a great solution, um, and it, it allows people to talk to each other while being in different locations. Um, but there's also some challenges, uh, and we'll, I'll, come, I'll talk a bit more about these challenges, because some of you may, may encounter them. When you do video conferencing, initially you would think that, oh, this is great, we can talk to each other as we would do in real life. However, uh, we know that when people communicate via laptops and digital devices, some dynamics change. So when you organize online, sc online calls, it's really important you control the meeting uh, because you're lacking verbal cues of when people want to interrupt. Uh, there's also the, the moderation and decision making, and usually it's good to separate the two uh, in terms of content and uh, who's controlling the content and who's controlling the flow of the meeting. And another criticism often in working in virtual teams or remotely is that there's a lack of follow-up. You know, the meeting is over, there's, you know, you hang up, you, there's no chat after the meeting about the next action, so a lack of follow-up is, is uh, uh, often a problem. Uh, there's also technical challenges. There's uh, equipment that has to work. Uh, you saw the search in webcams that are being bought. There is a compatibility that you have to take into account. And there are the users you have to think about. Not everybody in your organization might be as able, tech savvy, have the equipment, have the time and capacity to set up uh, and join remote meetings or might be familiar with it. And Part of that is digital literate and digital divide, and we'll come back to that a little bit later in the, in the lecture. But the communication itself is also really uh, a challenge because you might have cultural barriers that are less apparent when you're working remotely. People may have different styles of conducting meetings. Um, you are more looking at a screen than, than a person really in the, in the face, especially if you're not using webcams you don't have verbal, non-verbal communication. So it's hard to pick up on cues when somebody wants to speak up, when somebody tends to disagree but is a bit quieter. Uh, and of course, there is the, the, the attention that people uh, might wander when they're looking at a screen and there might be distractions around them, especially if you're working at home and have kids uh, these days. So you might remember that uh, video or the conference call from the BBC, the expert on BBC who gave an interview while his kids were, uh, came crashing into the room. Uh, and I'm sure many of you can relate to um, his uh, experience now. I'll also put a link there to a great YouTube video called A Conference Call in Real Life, uh, where they mock, uh, they replay what it would be if all the mistakes that happened in the conference call would happen in a real meeting. For example, people putting push out of the room, making coffee, not muting, or forgetting to unmute, and so on. Um, so just to give you some tips that I've used in the last days communicating online and some experience I had working with international uh, humanitarian and government agencies where we do a lot of these calls, uh, first of all, organize. So prepare as you would for a real meeting, perhaps even more. Um, tend to separate the, what you want to talk about from moderating the call. So it is good that somebody uh, thinks about what we want to achieve and somebody else is moderating uh, who's speaking and giving the words. So ensure that your meetings have a reason, that you know that everybody who joins the meeting knows what they're gonna do. Think about an alternative and a backup. In case the call fails, people can't join, there is a technical hiccup, uh, be ready to have an alternative. The alternative doesn't have to be an alternative technology. The alternative could also be we'll cancel the meeting. But you want to think about what happens if we can't do this call. Is it a bad thing? Can we postpone it? Do we need to do a phone call with everyone? And so on. So thinking about that ahead of time gives you more uh, peace of mind going into the call and you have a plan for when something goes wrong. And most of all, conference calls are things that you have to practice. As more as you do them, the more you become familiar with it. So, uh, and then for the communication, uh, try to build a rapport. There is, uh, as we do more and more online communication and video conferencing, we tend to lose the connection with people because we have efficient meetings, we're talking about them. Try to find alternative ways. I saw people organize dance parties, uh, drinking coffee virtually, and so on. So, 
try to not only make it about work because you will lose the personal connection. And we remember we talked in the beginning about how important collaboration is for the job satisfaction. And in large calls, um, you can take some lessons from radio communication. Um, they have specific protocols. And, and my number one tip would be think about muting and unmuting. So if you're not speaking, mute, unmute. When you want to speak, think before you speak. And use the chat option. It's great for quick comments, uh, numbers, confirmation, links, and so on. Okay. Enough about the practical tips. What does that mean that we have all these tools available now? That means that, we, that people can work any, anywhere we want. Well, I mean, our options are a bit limited these days, but essentially you could work anywhere around the world anytime you want. And that has sparked what we call digital nomads, people who, who don't have a fixed place, workplace, people who work whenever, wherever they want, and they'll take the laptop and they connect. And you will see if you Google digital nomads, you will see a lot of people, uh, especially in Starbucks and coffee places, moving around with their equipment. I'll give you one example of myself. Uh, I do a lot of work in humanitarian crisis management and information management. So when I go on training or I go on a mission, uh, I also tend to be a digital nomad. So half of my stuff and my equipment is packed with uh, uh, IT equipment. But that allows me to set up a nice uh, office with all facilities I need anywhere I arrive. So um, essentially, this is we're all becoming digital nomads now, be it at home or uh, elsewhere. So let's move on to the second part. What is behind these developments? What makes that possible? Um, first of all, the web has changed. I I'll put the, I won't play the YouTube clip here, but I'll put the link online uh, with the slides later. But the, the old days, uh, for people from my generation and older, the internet was, was a place you went to retrieve information, and if you wanted to put information on the internet, you would really need to learn how to program. You need to learn how computers operate, operate uh, how to push uh, messages online, and so on. So the web for most people, was really to retrieve information uh, in the 80s. So the clip here talks about a, how newspapers made their newspaper available on the internet back then. And you really had a separate department who was coding the messages and making them available. And as a user, you could only go to the dial into the newspaper office and retrieve that newspaper. So it was really uh, a passive one. That has changed. Uh, web technologies and developments in information and communication technologies has made it possible that uh, we can also contribute. So we call that Web 2.0. It's not only you as a active, uh, passive consumer, but you can also create content. Think about things you put on social media, on Instagram, on Twitter. Uh, that allows you to co contribute information. So these technologies make it easier for everyone to uh, contribute information. So. And that has also changed from the old days where the tech people ruled the internet and uh, at least the content of the internet. Now, uh, content creators are not per se the tech people anymore. They could be the creative, could be uh, businesses. Uh, so essentially anyone can now uh, contribute. It's not only the techies anymore. It's not only organizations anymore, it's also the individuals. And uh, there's a lot of tools available that allow you to do these things. So even if you're contributing in a Google Doc, it is you submitting information to the internet uh, that you can share with. So uh, I'll give you a minute to think about which tools there are to work online for each of them. And uh, there's probably many more, but here are a few. So for spreadsheets, you can, like for a lot of them, you can use uh, Google or Microsoft Office or Zoho. Um, so there's a plurality of tools to be found uh, online that allow people to contribute. Few, two more things about these evolving web uh, capabilities. The first one is mashups. So mashups, because we now can contribute information, but technologies also allow us to combine information. So that allows us to make portals and combine information. So one of these examples is uh, the dashboards that you see for the coronavirus. They pull in information from a variety of sources and present it to you as, uh, as an integrated view. So essentially, a website is doing the same thing as a user could. 
So these developments have allowed websites and computers to also read other websites and pull information in. So I won't go into the technical details about this, but if you're interested, you can look up Google, uh, you could look up APIs, application programming interfaces, extended markup language, XML, uh, JSON, and so on. So these technologies allow also websites to communicate and exchange information with each other. So not only individuals anymore, but also systems. And the second thing that is happening with this Web 2.0 is a network effect. So it means that um, because we're contributing information, a lot of these platforms are being formed that rely on a large number of users. So if you think about Reddit or social media, they get adopted because there is a critical mass. Uh, the same goes perhaps for within your organization. It's great if different tools are being introduced, but at some point, wherever the majority of people is going to, that's where the critical mass is going to be, and that's going to continue. So we call that the network effect, the effect of having a number of people on your platform, which makes it interesting for other people to join. And this is something, especially in these days when there's a lot of improvisation going on, to keep in mind, and where possible, to direct. Uh, because you might have people joining different platforms at this point, uh, people connecting with different tools. So over time, uh, it will emerge or will gravitate to where its most users are. So that is the technology. Let's talk a little bit about the content. Um, because we can, there's two kinds of knowledge that you could share. Uh, the, one, the first one is explicit knowledge. So explicit knowledge means uh, knowledge that we can uh, write down that is easily documented. Think about data, think about procedures, software, documents, anything that, that is easily digitized, for example, or easily uh, uh, relayed, presented, and transformed. The other one is tacit knowledge, and that's a bit harder uh, to to grasp because it is subjective, it happens in our minds. These are skills, experiences, insights. These are much harder to capture in a digital system and to transfer. So as we go to these digital systems, it, we, we need, we're working more on explicit knowledge and less on this tacit knowledge. I'll show you a bit uh, of an example of the two. Um, when we talk about explicit knowledge and generation and consumption, we call it, uh, it's called uh, combination. Uh, the reference to the paper from Polanyi is above. So for those kind of explicit to explicit, you can use automated systems. You can use these mashups that I refer to, intranets. Those are great places. So it's written communication, for example, in emails. It's something that's written down, it's something that's easily read. Uh, tacit knowledge is a bit harder. It usually happens in social interactions, and that's why we call it socialization. Uh, it's when people meet face to face, when you have communities where people transfer values, transfer insights and knowledge. Uh, something that's hard to capture. I mean, you can record a video like this, but uh, it's still not the same as being in person discussing specific subjects. It's still, this is quite passive. Um, but between the two, uh, are interesting things happening. So internalization is explicit knowledge that you start using internally is tacit knowledge. So for example, the things I'm telling here, I'm making them explicit, I'm showing them on slides, uh, I'll share them online later, they're in a video. However, if you want to act on it, you internalize that knowledge and you start applying it to your own situation. So that's online learning or stuff you find on the internet, uh, internet that you start using. Then there's the externalization is actually something uh, that is uh, tacit and I'm making it more explicit. So it's actually the other side of the lecture. It is where I have knowledge in my mind and I'm trying to put it in slides, I'm trying to make it explicit. So it could be answering questions from somebody. Uh, especially nowadays you might have in your organization a lot of people who need some uh, feedback you know, they might ask a question and answering that. So it's goes, you're, you use your tacit knowledge to answer an explicit question. A, a great example of where these two really happen is Wikipedia or any wiki or intranet or whatever system, knowledge management systems we call them you use. Because that's the place where, first of all, you are making your tacit knowledge explicit. What you know, how do you make sure that other people can read it? So think about manuals, tips, tricks. But you can also look at it as a place where you can find the information that is explicit and start using it for your own situations. 
so best practices. Uh, I'll give you one great example, uh, and I was chatting with them last night. It's a coronavirus tech handbook.com. So it's a set of Google documents that is being crowdsourced, which means people are collaborating on it online. And uh, in these documents, you can find tips, tricks for various situations on how to work uh, remotely and how to work online. So one of, the, one of the handbooks they're working on is a handbook for online education. So people are contributing knowledge that they have, their tested knowledge, making it explicit using these web 2.0 technologies, and other people can access it and start using it, uh, start accessing this explicit knowledge and start using it. So that transformation uh, from tacit to explicit and back to uh, tacit is becoming more and more important these days because before tacit knowledge to tacit knowledge is something that happens more in social interactions. So this uh, coronavirus tech handbook is a, is a great resource and you can contribute to it with your ideas and you can learn from others. Um, so this is the current st status of the, of, of the internet and the technologies, and, but there are more developments uh, going on. Uh, so there is the developments of the semantic web, which means that computers and systems will be even better in understanding what exactly is that each website application system holds and be able to understand the context of it. So computers could understand what is there and machines could talk to machines and learn from each other. So it allows you to better find the information. And then the web 3.0 is actually a different, is a, it is a development uh, of that's going on already where you centered around accessing information in a way that suits you. So at the location with the relevant information in a manner that's easily accessible. It doesn't have to be your phone, that doesn't have to be a browser. It could be you know, in devices that alert you or something it could be in uh, other Internet of Things applications. So it will be less visible, more integrated into devices, and more integrated into our daily life. Um, so there are a few examples of that already, but I won't go into the technical details yet. Just saying that there's more developments coming that you know, further make the distinction between our physical, you know, going online, retrieving information, and our tasks will become smaller and smaller. That gap, they will become more integrated and that gap will become less visible, tangible, feelable. Okay, so in the last part of this lecture, I wanna talk a little bit about the management of these remote collaborations and give some considerations. And now be careful, they're not, ex they're not exhaustive, they're not complete by any means, but these are some of the common elements that you will find when implementing systems and we're going to talk after the break we're going to take a talk a bit more about these challenges so first of all it's good to clarify again that when we talk about information systems especially in our courses in information management systems we're not talking only about IT and information technology that's definitely one part where you have the data you have the information uh, stored the knowledge that you want to transfer so let's say the content of the system and the technology you use to transfer it. So hardware, software, and networks, and infrastructure. But an information system exi com also exists of other components. The organization that you use it, whether that's a formal organization, a company, an institute, or your community, your neighborhood organization, volunteer, civic organization, doesn't matter. But within that organization, within that group, within that team, you will have policies, you will have a shared value culture, you will have processes that you will follow. And then perhaps the biggest component is the people. You know, they're the ones who are using it, but also supporting it, maintaining it, and so on. So when you design, when you implement a solution, you say, we wanna work remotely, we wanna implement virtual teams, or we're gonna move to an enterprise resource planning system, or whatever, don't always focus on the technology, also consider what it means for your organization, what it means for your people, and how you can connect, uh, align these four elements in order to have a successful adoption. Um, so let's take a look at those uh, four components a bit in relation to uh, remote working and uh, online collaboration. First of all, uh, I already talked a bit about this data and the information and the knowledge, the content of, that were being shared. Um, I already mentioned this tacit explicit. So that's an extra effort that we have to make when we work remotely. We have to start typing, we have to start 
producing videos. So there is an extra step in transferring our tacit knowledge to somebody else when we're working remotely. So we have to think about how do we capture this knowledge. So I'm, I'm lucky at the university where I have these options and these people that can facilitate and help me uh, make that knowledge explicit. Uh, but for organizations, depending on what you're trying to do, that might be different. So also think about how to allow for updates. You know, lectures might be valid for a couple of years even, uh, but other information changes quickly. So it is fine, you make something explicit, you type it, but how do you make sure that people know what the la latest relevant information is? Uh, there's chat options, you can use intranet portals, you can use updates and so on. But especially when you put things online, it's important that, you're, that people know which, which piece of information is the latest and how can we update it in case there is something that we need to change. Then um, there is now, with this push, you have to think about who has access to the data, to our information, to our knowledge. How? Not only in terms of security, but also in terms of accessibility. How do we make sure that people can find what they're looking for in an easy manner. There might be more and more information now being put online than ever before. So you have to think about where would people access it from, when, how, and how can we align what we design with that so that the threshold of reaching out, collecting that information becomes lower. So think, and of course, think about the considerations for privacy, safety, and security, but we'll talk in more and extensive detail in one of our later lectures about that, but especially uh, those uh, concerns when you're using public systems is something you have to be wary of. Okay, let's talk about the technology side uh, of that, and for all of these four points, we're gonna talk more about this after the break in the panel, but this is a graph of the Amsterdam Internet Exchange, which is a major internet connection point for the Netherlands. And you can see that since the outbreak started and as measures being in, in produced, that the throughput in terabytes per second is increasing. So our network infrastructure is being put to the test. More people are working online. Video is pretty heavy in bandwidth use. So um, there is a, there, you can follow the graph. I'll put the link there as well uh, from the Amsterdam Internet Exchange. And I'm sure every country has something like that. You can see the increase in traffic and our networks and that are being used. And so that will be a challenge as well to keep your infrastructure in line with this growth. Uh, and every organization is now working to, to see how they can uh, provide the facilities. There have been outages. I've heard some companies are even doing stress testing at the moment just to see what the capabilities are so they can take appropriate measures. Um, Coming back a little bit to the privacy, safety, and security that I talked about data, the same applies to uh, the technology. First of all, you might now see options like Google is offering free software, uh, other companies have reduced prices. So there's a lot of options that suddenly have become interesting. And a lot of people are using them. Um, but uh, as I said, you have the network effect. As soon as more and more people start joining you on the platform, the more interesting it becomes for others to join as well. And all of a sudden, everybody's on the platform and you can't move away anymore. As an organization, as, you, as we move through the crisis and you start, you know, want to consolidate the systems, you might experience what we call a vendor lock. So once you start using the systems, it becomes easy to use associated systems from them. You adapt the ecosystem and it limits your choices in the future to adapt. Um, I'm not saying that it's, that it's per se a bad thing to go uh, to, to use external vendors and outsourcing, just a mindful consideration in rapidly doing something because it's very hard to move away from a system once people are in it. Then the second part is dependency and control. Uh, you will see uh, here was an outage of Microsoft Teams in northern, uh, northwestern Europe last Monday for two hours. Um, clouds and solutions which these drive are great. Um, they allow for a large, much larger scale than any individual organization could be. But you do have limited control uh, options to intervene. You're sort of dependent on the capabilities of others. Uh, again, not saying that that's a bad thing, it's just a consideration. Um, and again, uh, what I said during the video conference call, think about what your options are for backups and fallbacks. 
And then there is, of course, privacy. A lot of these companies uh, nowadays, if you use free software, uh, a lot of that software, you, you might already know, you pay with your data. Um, so, uh, uh, for example, I personally also used Zoom a lot, but if it's, it's worth checking these systems and Googling them before you fully commit to them. Um, you should also remember that your employees, or students in our case, don't have a choice. If, if we as a teacher say, we're gonna use Zoom, there's limited things that they can do. So you're sort of forcing other people to adopt the systems that you're doing. Um, so again, uh, not a, a bad thing uh, per se, but a careful consideration for all these elements is in order. So then for organizations, uh, remember in the beginning we talked about why do we collaborate? And um, now we, as we're collaborating more and more online, we have to start making different agreements. So our decision-making processes change. Um, how do you make decisions online? Not everybody might be comfortable in speaking up in an online meeting. Uh, so how do you make sure that people you know, are committed, are supporting you really? That absence of nonverbal cues also changes how we make decisions. And uh, I think that's, that's a key consideration. Think about meetings, protocols. Do we have to have meetings? How do we communicate? Uh, and your standing procedures. So for us as a university, there is a lot of things that we have in our documents and in our internal regulations that require, uh, that have always assumed that people would meet in person. And we have to start revising those procedures. So it might be worth checking, even if you're not thinking about it now, um, or might not have encountered them, what does that mean? Are all our procedures still valid? Are they working? Do we need to adapt them? Um, and then for the engagement. So what you could see, and it, perhaps you could even encourage it, is that aside from meetings, you could also have digital communities. I know organizations are using things like Slack, MetaMost, Microsoft Teams to also have these informal communication going on. Um, I saw on Twitter uh, last week uh, that people uh, did an online dance party. So they made a group video call, put on music, and started dancing together. So it is something that is also important that, you know, if you want to keep the social cohesion, it, it should not only be about work. Your organization is more than the procedures. Um, so talk to your HR people, think about how to keep people connected. And make sure everybody's in, and I'll come back to that in a, in a minute as well. Because for some jobs, for us as teachers, it might be relatively easy to do our, some of our teaching online. But for other jobs, uh, think for example, IT support, uh, facility services, they don't have an option or their job doesn't lend very well for working remotely online, which creates a disparity in your organization. So think about how do you include everyone in, in the system. And then the last component I wanna talk about is this fit between the people and the technology. So how do you stay in touch? And it is important that you evaluate regularly. Uh, keep monitoring it. Don't assume that you put an application or a system in place and things are solved. Um, this is from, uh, I saw in Wuhan, where uh, teachers were using an app to send kids homework. And the kids realized that this app was in, is in the Apple Store, so they all start giving it negative reviews. So much that it was in one star and got removed from the store. Um, so. Not, I'm not, sorry, for, by the way, I'm not encouraging my students to start downvoting any applications we're using, uh, but I'm recommending organizations to keep an eye on what your users are doing, what people are perceiving. So also evaluate regularly if it's still working. Reach out because people might not tell you directly. And think about support because it's great that you have a lot of support, that you have these systems, but before I could take my laptop to the IT service desk, now I need my laptop to contact the service desk. So, you know, supporting, providing support for remote support remotely is a bit of a paradox that you also have to uh, think about. And it might require a different way of providing that support uh, through phone numbers, additional assistance, and so on. The last point I want to, to conclude this, this section with is that, uh, is this what we call the digital divide. For some of us, it might feel very comfortable to work remotely, to work online. Uh, you have the skills, you have the equipment at home, 
uh, maybe have the peace of mind at home, but not everybody has that. You, people might not have the opportunity, they don't, might not have the time. Some people find it difficult, they're not trained for it. So that is what we call the digital divide. And the risk is that this digital divide now will become bigger than ever. Um, because people who are digital literate will have access to more information, are able to communicate faster and quicker, and it will make the, the gap bigger. So people with time, resources, um, will benefit from it. And I would personally recommend to also think about the older uh, people, people who are, uh, or people who are affected by the coronavirus. For many of us, it is easy to go online, to go on social media, to connect, to keep these interactions going. Not everybody has that option. So please don't forget to pick up your phone and also call people. Uh, find alternative ways. Don't stay only in the, in the internet bubble. Find other ways to especially reach those who are not there. It's easy to focus on the people who are online. Do not forget the people who are offline. Okay, so that's the four components I wanted to, uh, to talk about in this last part. The, the data and the information we're transferring, the technology we use, the organization, and the people in the system. Um, so I want to wrap up this part by first of all thanking our IT staff, and I recommend uh, you do the same in your organization. So uh, we've been, uh, a lot of these people have been working day and night to make sure that the system scale up uh, that, we're, that people who are working in the organizations have the support they need. And um, they're often invisible, as you can see now, they're an invisible group of people behind the scenes. So uh, I personally want to thank everybody here at the university for their support, uh, and I recommend that everybody also uh, does that for their organization. 